this morning, our topic is a very important topic. Uh, this is critical to the second Exodus movement because this is one of the institutions that God is restoring one of the institutions that will equip the church to meet all its challenges and master all of its circumstances. Theocratic order and authority. Okay. For our prayer thought, we will look at Councils to the Church, page 241, paragraph 4. Christ gives power to the voice of the Church. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. No such thing is countenance as one man starting out upon his own individual responsibility and advocating what views he chooses, irrespective of the judgment of the church. So we see that what the church of Christ binds on earth is bound in heaven. And as a church member, we cannot take it upon ourselves to advocate our own views irrespective of the judgment of the church. So, and we know that this is referring to the true, the true church, the true part of the church, God's movement within the movement. And th this word irrespective means like it doesn't matter what the, the judgment of the church is. It doesn't matter what the church's stance on it is. You have your own stance and, and you're just going to carry it out. that is considered being an unfaithful church member. And we're gonna see why. God has bestowed the highest power under heaven upon his church. It is the voice of God in his united people in church capacity, which is to be respected. Right, so in his, in his united people, the church as a body, as an association, that is to be respected because the voice of God in the voice of God is in that. The word of God does not give license for one man to set up his judgment in opposition to the judgment of the church. Neither is he allowed to urge his opinions against the opinions of the church. If there were no church discipline in government, the church would go to fragments. It could not hold together as a body. There have ever been individuals of independent minds who have claimed that they were right that God had especially taught, impressed, and led them. Each has a theory of his own, views peculiar to himself, and each claims that his views are in accordance with the word of God. Each one has a different theory and faith, yet claims special light from God. Look at all of the independent movements that are in the video right now. 
Look at all the independent movements and new ones are starting. I don't even want to call any names. If you are on Facebook, you can see. All of these people have doctrines and theories and ideas and they all think that they're led by God. Look how wicked the deceptions of Satan are to blind men so much to, so that they are proud about their errors. But also people who are even legitimate or legal members of, because they can be legal, but not really legitimate in heart, members of God's true association set up their judgment in opposition to the judgment of the church and urge their opinions against the opinions of the church, of the association hold on to their own doctrines. How can this, how can God have such an order? How can the work be finished if there is no order, if there is no authority, if there is, if there is no um, a, ability or power to settle matters and to, and a system for having light and continuity and unity. What, it, what would it become? Just a free-for-all or a democracy? The primary example that, that I can think of right now, the current example, and there will be more because there's going to be constantly more tests. The issue of the COVID-19 vaccine. God's association, God's true church, has said that it is not a sin to take the vaccine, and it may be the best for you to take, best for you personally to take the vaccine. And yet still, and this has been going on for months, yet still, members of the church are setting up their judgment in opposition to the judgment of the church by sharing uh, false critical news, um, conspiracy theories and all kinds of criticisms and denunciations and uh, things that would uh, cause fear and distrust and all that. When in reality, that is something that is directly contrary to the teaching of the association. This is not the way that God operates. So this is a, a very important lesson for us to learn. Um, there is much um, light in the message on this. This is a very, very spiritual issue and a very, significant spiritual issue. Let's continue to reading. These draw away from the body and each one is a separate church of himself. Wow, this is Satan. This is exactly what Satan did in heaven. All these cannot be right, yet they all claim to be led of the Lord. And everyone who sets out their contrary views think that they're led of the Lord. But, but it, because if they don't think that they're led of the Lord and they're doing it, then um, they can't be a Christian. They can't be a follower of Christ. They would be admitting that they would be working for Satan. Or in some cases, maybe they're not even thinking about it. What am I doing? Am I serving Christ or am I serving Satan? So these are things that we must think about. Um, we must apply them to our lives and see um, where we um, line up and really let us meditate and see the wisdom in this. 
even if we don't personally agree with something, let's not urge our opinions against the opinions of the church or set up our judgment in opposition to the judgment of the church, which creates more reproach, disharmony, and confusion. My apologies, brethren, we had a <clears throat> slight technical difficulty there. And now we're gonna go into our prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for gathering us together for this um, special meeting. We pray that the spirit of truth may be exalted. We pray that Christ may be exalted and we may be put down. We pray that we may uh, understand your system of theocracy and order and the authority that you have established with that. And that we may understand the need for law and order um, and, the, and the need to reflect heaven and please give us the faith the strength the power and the wisdom to do so in jesus name amen God is a God of order. Everything connected with heaven is in perfect order. Subjection and thorough discipline mark the movements of the angelic host. Success can only attend order and harmonious action. God requires order and system in his work now, no less than in the days of Israel. All who are working for him are to labor intelligently, not in a careless haphazard manner. He who would have his work done with faith and exactness, he would have his work done with faith and exactness, sorry, that he may place the seal of his approval upon it. Right, so everything needs to be subject to order and discipline as the 
far as the work for the church and really the operation of the universe goes. So if the universe operates under order and God operates under order and heaven operates under order, the church, which is the body of Christ, the, the earth, the earthly family of heaven must also reflect order. Satan has order in the way that he uses his, um, his army. But he wants the church to be foolish and have disorder there because he knows that, that he can defeat our purposes. God is not the author of confusion, but of peace as in all churches of the saints. He requires that order and system be observed in the conduct of church affairs today, no less than in the days of old. He desires his work to be carried forward with thoroughness and exactness so that he may place his seal of approval upon it, so that he may place upon it his seal, his seal of approval. Christian is to be united with Christian church with church, the human instrumentality cooperating with the divine, every agency subordinate to the Holy Spirit and all combined in giving to the world good tidings of the grace of God. This is the best way and it's the only way. Christian united with Christian, church with church and every human instrumentality cooperating with the Holy Spirit. And we're gonna see what it means to cooperate with the Holy Spirit more because the Holy Spirit also has a system. Now, we begin with the message itself. All of us must be subject to the, to the message itself because the message itself has authority and it has the most authority. God's word is even above his own name. So God is not a hypocrite. God is, God is himself a representative of order. He, God is subject to order. His name, his glory, his, 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 his character. All of that is established by his word. His word is the truth. So God lives by the truth. So must we in truth, since the rod is a symbol of authority. See, the rod itself is a symbol of authority. So we must learn about authority. There must be authority in the in the in the rod message and in the giving of the rod message, correction and deliverance. The, then what other title could more fittingly signify that it is to deliver the penitent and do away with the impenitent. Amen. Unmistakably, therefore, the clear light shedding forth from type, from testimonies of the prophets and from history. The type is the Exodus movement led by the shepherd Moses who had his rod as a symbol of correction, as a symbol of authority, correction, and deliverance. This identifies the message of the rod as the only one ordained to lead the latter day church, freed from sin and sinners into the land of promise when the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. So the rod is ordained for this work. So it is the only message that we have 
the command to follow or the call to follow. The rod is the message with the authority today. Obviously, therefore, God will pity all who come under the authority of his rod today, confessing their sins and seeking mercy. Mm. So Christ is the good shepherd and he has a rod. And we must come under the authority of the rod. What does that mean? To obey it. To seek to obey it. Whatever the sins are, whatever sins they're practicing in the church, in the world, whatever it is, we may obtain mercy, but we must come under the authority of the rod. But he will have no mercy upon the disobedient. Not even upon any who covet the Babylonish garment of today. Important that he will have no mercy on the disobedient. <clears throat> this very truth to which we are listening this afternoon will, therefore, on the one hand, slay those who reject it together with those who are disobedient to it. But on the other hand, save those who give heed to it and who comply with its requirements. So the rod, it, 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 has, a, it has a judgment um, component just built into it. And it, the rod itself will slay us. We are slayed, slain by the truth. Either the truth saves us or it slays us. So those who reject it will be slain, but not only those who reject it, but those who are disobedient to it. So there are some who accept it, but they're, but they're disobedient to it. But for those who comply, they will be saved. Answer book three, page 33 and 34. Let those who resist giving full submission to inspiration ask themselves what they would have done had they lived under Moses and his rod. Full submission. This is what the rod calls for, for us to give full submission to it. We cannot have pieces and parts and, and not accept the whole message and not obey the whole message. So as the, in the type, in the Exodus movement, the authority of Moses as symbolized by his wielding the rod, that is what, that is the conditions that we are living under today. It's not the wild, wild west. That's how God looks at it as far as the church is concerned, and as far as the world is concerned, they're going to have to hear the rod too. They're gonna to have to pass under the rod too. Continuing, he acknowledged himself to be the mouthpiece of God, just as today's rod does. It is a message that demands obedience. It will be noted, it will be noticed that the third decree threatened the lives of disloyal men and nations. Whosoever shall alter this word, said the king, let his house be made a dunghill for this. So much for the type. Now we come to the anti-type. The type reveals that the messages of 1844 and 1888 are to be followed by a third one. But according to the type, the third message is to be a severe one. You see? This third message 
that's going out is saying, that it demands obedience. It will slay those who reject it and those who are disobedient to it. But it will save those who comply with its requirements. So this third message is a severe one. This, these quotations are to help us to um, understand the the gravity of the issue and the, the significance of the message and what there is at stake and how God views this. It is a message that will demand obedience. That comes from authority when you can demand obedience. It is a message and it is the word of Christ. It is a message and based on what we choose to do, we show whether or not we are his sheep or not, if we are a sheep or a goat. Remember, goats are very unruly. And that's why they have to be slain. Can you imagine a goat being in the kingdom? Imagine that the kingdom is a fold and you have all these sheep and then you just have a goat in there being unruly and disobedient and self-willed and selfish, butting and fighting and biting and not moving up with the pack or just, no, we can't have that in the kingdom. So it's we ourselves that choose whether we wanna live or die. Continuing, it is a message that will demand obedience and enforce executive judgment upon those who would oppose its decree. Wow. So if we're not living the message, we are opposing the decree because the message is saying to do this and that, and we're choosing to do the other thing. So we are opposing its decree, no matter what we say. Now the Bible says that there will be sore punishment for the disobedient in the antitype and in the type. Hebrews 10, verse 28 and 29. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. There was some serious church government and discipline then. But because we are um, in uh, a time of grace, really, with the fifth trumpet, we are not seeing destruction for disobedience but it is coming. 20, verse 29, of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the son of God? Mm, this is serious. And hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the spirit of grace. So when Christ came to make that sacrifice, this opened a whole new door of grace to the people in the Christian, dem, dem, the Christian dispensation under the fifth trumpet. But how much sore punishment shall we be thought worthy if we trod Christ under our foot or we walk over him, we, we disregard and disvalue his the sacrifice and the grace and the mercy. So the spirit of grace is here to call us to repentance. And he will have mercy on those who confess their sins and seek forgiveness. But he will have no mercy on the disobedient. We're on the last mile home. And we're getting ready to have our, our solemn assembly and our antitypical Passover and leave Egypt.
Continuing, the Passover too, in which perished all the firstborn of man and beast that were found in dwellings, which had not the blood on the doorposts, forespoke an antitypical Passover in which all who are left without the mark because of not sighing and crying for the abominations in their midst will, will surely fall under the slaughter weapons of the angels. So we see that Ezekiel 9 is the antitypical Passover. And we must have the blood of Christ applied to our lives. Because there is not only forgiveness and justification, but there is power for retained justification. There's power for sanctification. There's power to receive the seal of God. And we are, we are commanded to receive the seal in our foreheads. Continuing about um, Egypt and the Passover. And you remember what took place the night of the Passover, the night before they left Egypt. Moses had proclaimed throughout the land that in every dwelling where no blood was found on the doorpost, that very night the firstborn in each such dwelling would die. But you know what? We have a problem. We don't take God seriously enough. Man does not take God seriously enough. But God's word is not a joke. It's not a lie. It can't return unto him void. So what he says, he will do. And we see that God works through a person. And God is, God has a servant today. And he always has a servant. And when it's the time for the solemn assembly, we're going to have the same experience. The, tr the second trumpet of Joel 2 is going to blow. And everyone is going to need to have the blood on their doorposts at that solemn assembly. And if they don't, they will die. Continuing, those who disobeyed the divine injunction were on the day following busily moaning and burying their dead. Why are they moaning? Were they surprised? Sometimes, you know, there's a saying that says that he who doesn't hear must feel. So God tries to um, teach us lessons in, in every, any way that will save us. But sometimes it's just going to be too late for some for some people. It's just going to it's just going to be too late. They're never going to learn. They're, they're never going to learn their lesson, essentially. Continuing while those who obeyed the command were joyously. Amen. And orderly marching out of the cities. Amen. Going to inherit the kingdom of God, heading to inherit the kingdom of God. This is the 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 band we want to be a part of on the chariot of his salvation, going to Eden restored. Continuing, yes, only those who were able to take orders were made free from slavery. That's what, that's the type. That's why there needs to be order and authority so that there can be the giving and taking of orders and the learning of obedience. God intentionally sets us in families. And one of the reasons is for us to learn how to take orders, have respect, and be obedient. That's one of the main reasons. It is a microcosm of heaven. Because if you can't respect your parents, you cannot respect and obey God. 
And that was the problem with the angels. So God set something up wherewith he can test us. Continuing, it is therefore prerequisite, meaning this is something you have to learn before, that we learn to take orders if we are to receive the seal of God in our foreheads. So can, if somebody is an independent and they start their own rod ministry, can they learn how to take orders? Are they taking orders? Ironically, they're going to want to give orders. And they're going to want their people to take orders. And what if those people are like them and don't want to take orders? Then they're going to split off again. And it's just going to be a train of self-will and unruliness, even though they shouldn't be uh, subject to those false ministries anyway, but it's just that nobody's uh, taking orders. And that's a condition that's very, very perilous for one's salvation. And it will be quite difficult in the light of the rod to have a justification for ignorance, justification by ignorance. Let those who resist giving full submission to inspiration, it's inspiration that we have to give full submission to. So inspiration is alive today to test us as it was in the days of the Exodus movement is here today. Continuing, ask themselves what they would have done had they lived under Moses and his rod. What would they have done? The, he had the rod and he was and he was there guiding and leading and telling them where to go and, and what to do. Could they have tried to stay in the camp and be disobedient? Well, they would have perished. Continuing, he acknowledged himself to be the mouthpiece of God, just as today's rod does. So we must learn to obey the rod. So we see that the shepherd's rod message demands obedience and those who do not obey it must be slain. Now we shall endeavor to explore some of the things which the shepherd's rod demands of us Davidians so that we may know our duty and what we ought to obey if we want to live and not perish. So this is getting deeper into the second level because now that we know that we must obey the rod, okay, now what is it, what does the rod say? Because if we're not doing what the rod says, we're being disobedient. The rod establishes a, a, an association. Here we see the cover of the Leviticus of the Davidian Seventh-day Adventist. There's reason that this book is written to establish order in the church, in his true church. There's an association that's authorized by the rod. Now, if the rod says that this association is to do the to finish the work, why would we start another association? That's disobedience or ignorance. But there's no provision made for willful blindness. Provisional in setup as well as in name the Davidian Seventh-day Adventist Association. There's only one. The Wave Chief has been creeping into using the name, changing their name, adjusting their name. You, you know, still they still use GADSDA2, which doesn't make any sense. How can you be the G General Association of Davidian Seventh-day Adventist and the Davidian Seventh-day Adventist Association? It just shows uh, sophistry, foolishness, and... Um, wickedness really and blindness but at least on the part of of those who are uh 
leading and promoting it. Now, they have come to adopt, they first they were the Davidian Seventh-day Adventists Association, which is a um, small minor deviation. When you do counterfeiting, you have to make it very close to the real. Um, like counterfeit clothes and stuff like that. It's very close design to fool or so that either the buyer could be fooled or the buyer could fool other people. Now, they dropped the S after Adventist, which the, the phrase didn't make any grammatical sense in English. They, little by little, they dropped the S and now they claim to be the Davidian and the Adventist Association. How satanic. But once we do our job, we don't have anybody to worry about. But I was just getting, I was just mentioning that because now there's supposedly another the Davidian Seventh-day Adventist Association. But really, in reality, there isn't. This association began to be emerged in 1930 and was fully emerged in 1961. Praise the Lord. Provisional in setup, as well as in name, the Davidian Seventh-day Adventist Association exists solely to accomplish a divinely appointed work, a, a work appointed by God within the Seventh-day Adventist denomination, wherein it therefore strictly confines its activities. That's Leviticus page two. This association shall be known provisionally as the Davidian Seventh-day Adventists. That's the association that's authorized by the rod. And that association has a constitution Laws upon which it must operate. Laws upon which it is founded. That is order. As its work therewith in draws to a close, associations and the servants of our God are sealed. Its name will be changed. And its purpose and its work will become all embracing to the gospel. Then its constitution, this association has a constitution, and bylaws as here and codified will become fully operative. So this association has laws which it is governed by, which is given by God in the rod. This constitution is the guide for our reformation. As restorers of every divine institution, including theocratic order, we are glad to announce to the readers of present truth that beside the literature of revival, they may also they may now also obtain that of reformation. Our organizational publication, the Leviticus of the Davidian Seventh-day Adventists. So the Leviticus is to help us to reform, come under God's order. Reformation means to change oneself for the better to reorganize the moral powers under divine guidance. So God is guiding. Leviticus page 12 and 13. Thus raised of necessity, not of choice, this association within the Seventh-day Adventist organization is ordained, meaning established by God, for set apart by God for this, to the work of a threefold end. It is to go to the house of Israel and Judah and say to them that were bidden, come, for all things are now ready. The message of the rod is here. The restoration of all things is at hand. And though they who first hear the call may excuse themselves, the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind from the streets and the lanes of the city will respond. Accordingly, it is to implement that great reformatory movement and purification called for among God's people. So we see that the shepherd's rod message ordains a specific association for the finishing of the work and establishes the governmental system for that organization. These are institutions that we must cooperate with if we are to be saved.
if we have the opportunity to know. And we have much opportunity today. Now, that's the first thing. God has an, as a, has an association. That's the that first things are first. So we can't just do whatever we want. All right. Now, how does that association run? Let's listen to what the rod says. Our opinions don't matter. What matters is the word of God. God is to rule in his church now as he did in Moses' time. What did he do in Moses' time? He was leading through Moses. And there was order and discipline. Continuing, God was the center of authority. That is what is important here. It's not man. God is the one who needs to be in control for us because he's the wise one. He's the loving one. He's the, he's the faithful one, not us. Our hearts are deceitful and desperately wicked. How are we going to run his work? That really doesn't make any sense. How are we going to run God's work? We don't have the wisdom, the knowledge, the love, the care to run God's work for him while he sits back. So it's his humility. We need to humble ourselves underneath God and not be like Satan who wanted to take over heaven and God's work. God was the center of authority and government, the sovereign. God was the center of authority and government, the sovereign of Israel, the ruler. That's what the rod says. That's what the spirit of prophecy says. God was the one who was ruling. Moses stood as their visible leader, just the visible one, by God's appointment to administer the laws in his name. So the laws that are administered, do this, do that, don't do this, don't do that. It's on Christ's authority. How do we know that the Lord is here leading today? Because his throne is here. A throne is something that you rule from. And I saw as the color of amber and as the appearance of fire round about within, within it, from the appearance of his loins, even upward, and from the appearance of his loins, even downward. I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire, and it had brightness round about, as the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain. So was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face and I heard a voice of one that spake. And it came to pass that when he had commanded the man clothed with linen, saying, Take fire from between the wheels, from between the cherubims. Then he went in and stood beside the wheels. To this marvelous scene, which Ezekiel saw on the riverbank in the land of the Chaldeans, our undivided attention is now called, being the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. Obviously, then, it was the Lord on one of his thrones. So Ezekiel saw the Lord himself on one of his thrones. As the prophet was looking toward the north, he saw a great cloud coming like a whirlwind to earth, watching with intense interest. It's drawing nearer and nearer. Finally, he saw the living creatures, the wheels, and the rest the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. Whereupon I fell, he says, upon my face, and I heard a voice of the one that spake, 
unmistakably the Lord himself come to give a message, came to give a message to Ezekiel. It was the Lord himself. So this is what happened in the antitype. The Lord himself came to give the message to antitypical Ezekiel, Brother Haltith. But the Lord himself in, arrive, in arriving to the earth to give this message. Is he still here to order and direct the work? Let's hear what the ride says. The fact, therefore, that from the chariot, the Lord commands the prophet to go to speak, bear the message to the people. And since it is already here, it must, of course, be the divine instrumentality through which, as a sort of base of operations, the Lord is ordering and directing his work and through which he shall do so until. So this is a base of operations. This chariot is a base of operations. It resides at a headquarters and the Lord orders and directs the work. He's in control. This is the instrumentality for the theocratic order today. God himself is here. Christ himself is here on the throne to order the work. And, and he, since he came, he's, he decided to use the chariot until the gospel of the kingdom be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations and the end come. And we will leave with him on his chariot. God is to rule in his church now as he did in Moses' time. The government of Israel was characterized by the most thorough organization, wonderful alike for its completeness and its simplicity. The order so strikingly displayed in the perfection and, ar and arrangement of all God's created works was manifest in the Hebrew economy. God was the center of authority and government, the sovereign of Israel. Moses stood as their visible leader by God's appointment, his name. From the elders of the tribes, a council of 70 was afterward chosen to assist Moses in the general affairs of the nation. Next came the priests, who consulted the Lord in the sanctuary. Chiefs or princes ruled over the tribes. Under these were captains over thousands and captains over hundreds and captains over fifties and captains over tens. And lastly, officers who might be employed for special duties. So there was an order of, it's a hierarchy. There was different types of uh, activities like for the soldiers, the, the military, the, the priesthood, but um, in, the, in the civil government, and these all had a hierarchy underneath it. So God sets man over man. And that's the only way that a united body of people can operate in an organized way. There has to be hierarchy. There has to be authority. And this is how this is reflected in it. This is a reflection of heaven where God is the center of authority. So in this rebellious earth, man must learn to come under God's authority and learn lessons of humility and submission. So like Israel, Accordingly, this reformatory association intestine to the Seventh-day Adventist organization embraces an all-inclusive scriptural fundamentalism, meaning all the types. We include the, the, the teachings of all the types as interpreted by antitypical Elijah. 
and it is necessarily endowed with constitution and bylaws. I'm gonna skip a part. Revealing that God is the center of authority and men of his appointment are the administrators of his law. So God appoints people to administer his law. And thus we have a hierarchical system of church government on earth. How is the association organized? The association has regular officers. This is written in Leviticus. The regular officers of this association shall be a president, a vice president, a secretary, and a treasurer. This is how God's association is organized. And he chooses his president, who in turn appoints the other officers. Reflecting theocratic order. As in the days of Moses and his rod. The president shall act as chairman. And, and, and it says that the type for the president is Moses. That's what those references that I, I excluded say, as shown. So the type is Moses, is Moses and his government. Act as chairman of the executive council and as chief administrator of the affairs of the association. So there is a chief administrator and there has to be in order to have order. God himself cannot rule over the proud, self-important and self-sufficient. But as to his people, even children and women rule over them. Why? Because his people are humble. So women and children can rule over them if God appoints them to do so. So if the person is younger than them and, they're, and God appointed them, his true people will still take orders and be, and be obedient. And if a woman is appointed to rule over them, they will still take orders and be obedient. There is a certain element whom even God himself cannot convince that he has taken the reins in his own hands. Now, this is a very serious thing. Let me break this down a bit. When things happen in regards to God's association and people complain and murmur or orders go out and people complain and murmur, what that shows is that they don't believe. Okay, either they believe God is a liar and he's not faithful, he doesn't have their best interests, he's he doesn't and he's or he's incapable, or they don't believe that God is in control. So, but God repeatedly manifests himself and he gives us mercy and tries and 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 and, and opportunities. That's why it says that God can't cannot convince them because he tried to. That's what it's showing, that God tried to convince them that he has the reins in his hands, but he couldn't. So no matter what, no matter how much God tried to convince them by, by showing and demonstrating, when things happen that they don't believe or they don't like, they still complain, murmur, bicker, and oppose it. So God cannot convince them that he has the reins in his own hands. Continuing, they never take orders from any but themselves. This is a person that's disobedient. They cannot be, they cannot read in the house of David. They cannot be in heaven because they're a goat and goats cannot be in the kingdom or in heaven. Can you imagine that? Really a goat being in the kingdom? The children, listen, the children who are raised there, if, are, if they're disobedient, 
the rod says that their mother and their father will deliver them to the executioner. It's not going to be tolerated. Continuing, such independent ones, the rod doesn't teach independence. For you to claim to be an independent and to be a Davidian is a self-condemnation. Such independent ones. And even if you are part of the association and you're still doing your own thing, you're still really independent and under condemnation for being independent. Such independent ones will continue to question and criticize everything in which they themselves have no part. That's a reference to the spirit of prophecy where it says that the people are questioning and criticizing the work, but Jesus is gonna surprise them at their unholy feast. You know what their feast is? Their feast is their criticism. They're sitting down, they're, they're gossiping, they're murmuring, they're, criti they're criticizing and they're bickering. That's the feast that they're having. So regardless of their profession, it does not matter that they say that they're a Vidian, they're with Bashan, it doesn't matter. So regardless of their profession, of what they think or say, they are not God's people, just based on their behavior. And that's the actual real token of our faith, what we do. And in the antitype, we have it. And you remember what took place the night of the Passover, the night before they left Egypt. Moses had proclaimed throughout the land, who is Moses, God's servant. In the antitype, we have the call to the solemn assembly that in every dwelling where there were no blood was found in the doorposts that very night, the firstborn in each such dwelling would die. Those who disobeyed the divine injunction, this is not Moses speaking, this is God speaking through Moses, were on the, on the day following, busily moaning and burying their dead. While those who obeyed the command were joyously and orderly marching out of the cities. Yes, only those who were able to take orders were made free from slavery. It is therefore prerequisite that we learn to take orders. So what do what I'm do you so based on this statement, do we really think we can be independent and then be saved and go to the kingdom? There's no way, it's not possible. So some uh, people who believe that you can be independent. Okay, I have to mute somebody because they're writing on the screen. Some people who believe that they can be, we're going to be, we're going to, it can be independent in this group, in that group, and then we're all, we're all going to be go to the kingdom based on I don't know what standard, and then in the kingdom. There's going to, then we're going to get the Holy Ghost and become united. Really? The Holy Spirit doesn't force us to believe anything. If we want to be united, we can be united here based on what he's teaching us, the truth. The Holy Ghost is not coming to unite us on, on doctrine in the kingdom. We're sealed on this side, which is a, spiritual and intellectual settling into the truth. And we receive the power in the kingdom, the new heart. We see sin more deeply for what it is. But we're not going to get united. We have to go united to the kingdom. That's what the Exodus movement type shows. So let no, let no one deceive you with such a foolish doctrine. Those who disobeyed the divine injunction were on the day following, busily moaning and burying their dead, while those who obeyed the command were joyously and orderly marching out of the cities. Yes, only those who were able to take orders were made free from slavery. It is therefore prerequisite that we learn to take orders if we are to receive the seal of God in our foreheads. In the days of Moses, some rose up claiming that the Lord was speaking through them as well as through Moses. Hmm, this is an interesting thing. That's very interesting. What could have possessed them to do that? 
or to even think that. Why would God do that? And they were opposing Moses. So there's two lessons here. First of all, God does not, God has hierarchical system. He does not have two leaders on the same plane. No, 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 no. He has a hierarchical system and a servant who's directing the work. So this is a, a foolish lie. I couldn't, that's, I mean, they, some people fell for it. Maybe they wanted to fall for it. I think that that, that maybe, I, I think it looks foolish, but who knows? Maybe if I was living back then, I would have believed that too. Oh, God is leading through you and Moses. Hmm. You know, that doesn't really make sense. Why would he need to lead through all, you guys, not even just one person, you guys and Moses. And then you have contradictory doctrine. And God is leading through you too. The people should have known Moses was the one who was leading them from they were in Egypt. So if somebody's going to contradict Moses, then obviously that person is not from God. And somebody's contradicting God's association today, the person is not from God. But also, I should have realized that in God's system, that there's hierarchy and, and order. Continuing, their agitation, however, instead of bringing order and harmony, see, what is the devil aiming for? Confusion in the church. While his, he tries to order his movement so he can work efficiently and trying to create confusion in the church. Their agitation, however, instead of bringing order and harmony between themselves and Moses, brought confusion and dissension with the tragic result that thousands lost their lives. And many Davidians are on the path to being lost too. In and outside the association. Because of listening to Cora, Dathan, and Abiram's. Had the Lord spoken to those men, he, cert he would certainly have made the known the fact to Moses. So we can bring our concerns to the association. And the officer of the association, is God leading through this person over there too? This person over there is saying this and that. Is, is God leading through them too? What's going on? And we can find out the answer. Those who could have been the greatest help to Moses became the biggest hindrance to him. You know why? Because people have gifts and talents. And, but, they, but like Lucifer, they become lifted up in their, in their mind. And they want to take over. They're not, gonna be, they're not satisfied with their position. So while they could be a great blessing and a help to God's association, they become a hindrance by setting themselves against God. But they're doomed to failure and shame anyway. Continuing, they wanted Aaron's office. They wanted to be the high priest. They wanted Moses' office. They wanted to be the president. That was the core of their sin. That's the core of their iniquity. It's just selfish ambition. It's just their ambition. It's not that they don't know that order is necessary because what? When they get in office, what are they going to say? They want people to obey them. So they know that order is necessary, but they just want what they want. They want so they want their their position. They wanted Aaron's office. They wanted Moses' office. They refused to be satisfied with anything less. The Lord Himself got nowhere with them. Same thing happening today. The Lord is getting nowhere with people. The only thing He could do was to cause the earth to swallow them. That's the remedy. That's the only remedy that's left after someone goes down that path. Thus, in one day, thousands, practically all the so-called wise, these people, they may know the message, intellectual, this and that. 
but they're just a false wise because they end up losing their souls. Thus, in one day, thousands, think about all these false prophets. If they don't repent, they're all going to lose their souls. So all this rod that they're quoting, writing books, posting on Facebook, all that is vain and foolishness. Quoting all this rod, they're going to be in hell if they don't repent. Think about that. They're going to die in Ezekiel 9, or they're going to die and they're going to get up after um, the um, millennium, and they're going to be with all the wicked. And then they're going to burn in hell. And these are people who are quoting the rod, praying. <clears throat> they're turning, fell into the bowels of the earth. Are we too seeking office by which to exalt self? And are we too endeavoring to usurp the seat of the spirit of truth? That's a, that's a rhetorical question, but it's happening today because that's what the type shows. Let's look at this. Christians, now let's say Davidians. Davidians often think that the Israelites were very wicked and unruly people. You see what, what their problem was? They were wicked and unruly, rebellious. Nobody could tell them what to do. Most, God couldn't tell them what to do. Most important, I'm going to say nobody. God couldn't tell them what to do. And if we can't listen to God, we can't go to the kingdom. But after having their experiences to profit by, think how much worse we would be if we do, if we do as they did. Wow. This is important. What? How? What? Now, they were wicked and unruly, and they didn't have a, an excuse. But us, to see them be wicked and unruly and know the word of God, this is, Davidians should not be falling into this trap. This is one that God laid out. This is one that's obvious. I mean, this is, this is well taught in the message. We are type, anti-type, the establishment of organization, everything like that. Especially if you're a member of God's true association, the Davidian Seventy Evidence Association, you see these things. How? Why are you falling into the same trap? But you know what? As teachers of the message, as believers in the message, we need to share this part of the message. Continue to share this part of the message, especially when you see rebellion in your brethren. The Bible says not to suffer sin in a brother. When you see them going off and gossiping and murmuring and backbiting and trying to do their own thing, share this part of the message with them. Let them know that they will be much worse off if they do as the Israelites did by actually seeing them do that and reading about it and seeing it in the rod. If we do no better than they, how can we expect to be eligible for the seal and for the kingdom since they were not eligible? <clears throat> they were not eligible. And the people shall be oppressed, everyone by another and everyone by his neighbor. It's the wickedness that's going on in the earth now. The child shall behave himself proudly against the ancient and the base against the honorable. This is disobedience to the fifth commandment. There's no respect. You see, the first four commandments, it goes, it goes from the, 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 it starts from the respecting of God himself, the, the reverence to God. And then it goes down to, um, it goes down to um, more details about that, different aspects of that. And the, and the second part in, in regards to our, our second half, in regards to our duty to man, and what does it begin with? Honor your mother and your father. So it's like, it's like the first commandment of those in relation to human beings. That it very much dictates or establishes how you will behave in the world with other people. But now, 
the world, one of the signs that the world is far from God and deep in sin is that children are disobedient to their parents and unruly, showing that the people who God put in their lives to help them, to guide them in the right way, even Gentile parents don't want their kids to sin. in many ways because they see that it's gonna destroy them. They may be foolish and think, oh, I can drink a little bit, but if they find out that their kid is an alcoholic, they're not gonna be happy unless they themselves are, their, their mind or their brains are deteriorated. Yeah, I don't even think an alcoholic wants an, uh, their child to be an alcoholic. <clears throat> but, Children are disobedient to parents in the last days. And church members are disobedient to God. So that's why the rod has come for correction, to bring things into line and order. The child shall behave himself proudly against the ancient and the base against the honorable. Since these things are now taking place, we need not be ignorant of the fact that the great and dreadful day of the Lord is at hand. The unruly and disrespectful shall not survive the day. So we have to learn how to have respect. Let those who resist giving full submission to inspiration ask themselves what they would have done had they lived under Moses and his rod. He acknowledged himself to be the mouthpiece of God, just as today's rod does. So we see that the shepherd's rod message teaches that God has a theocratic and presidential form of government in his association. And therefore, independence or lack of submission to his governmental structure is condemned. And those who choose to follow such a proud and self-important path must be slain in the wilderness. Christ has further illustrated this incident in the parable of Mark 13, 34, where the son of man is as a man taking a far journey who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work and commanded the porter to watch. So Christ gave authority to his servants. Who are his servants? his church uh, workers, he gave them authority. Authority over the work. And he gave every man his work on top of giving authority to his servants. And then he commanded the porter to watch over the church affairs. So the porter is watching what's going on. Why? Because he's monitoring the work, or they're monitoring the work. Continuing, after a long time, from his ascension to the purification of the church, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. Mm. Consequently, the period of his absence ends at the purification of the church, at which time he reckons with his servants and himself take charge of his flock. Verily, verily, I say unto you that he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the, th the same is a thief and a robber. What does this mean? What does the rod say? Do you want to get into the sheepfold? If you do, you must get in through the door. You see the order that is established? And now we're going to see the theocratic governments. If you gain entrance in some other way, eventually, you will be cast into outer darkness by not going through the door. You must go through the door to be able to be, to be a shepherd, a minister, there to gnash your teeth. So there will be punishment for those who are not going through the door. From these alternatives, we all must make our choice. Or if you want to be a sheep in the sheepfold too, you can't just be a sheep just roaming around 
just in the mountains in the wilderness, you'll be considered a goat. You men and women came on this hill, not because somebody brought you, but because you thought it your duty. You nevertheless brought with you these little ones. So it is that you came through the door, but the boys and girls came in your luggage as it were. So when they came to the hill, they came through the door. But there's an examination. And now if they are to become permanent members of this sheepfold, they too must pass examination from the porter. John 10, 13, to him the porter openeth and the sheep hear his voice and he calleth his own sheep by name and leadeth them out. The porter, the one in charge, opens the door only to those who have complied the requirements for admission. So the porter is the one who's at the door. So if, the one, if one wants to get through the door, which we must go through, they must pass the porter's inspection. And if there's a sheep in sheepfold today, then there has to be a porter. Here the student of present truth will note that by this illustration, Christ points out that only that the only shepherds that he recognizes as his are those to whom the porter opens the door and invites them in. The student will also note that all others are branded as imposters and the sheep that hear the false shepherd's voice, he declares, are not his sheep. So God has his own organization. He has a government. He has the ministers, a system. And if we want to go some other way, other than the one that's established in the rod, the Davidian Seventh-day Adventist Association, then our shepherd, so-called, is an imposter. And we are goats. Only those who gain entrance through the door and to whom the porter the one through whom the spirit of prophecy is manifested opens are the authorized shepherds whose voices God's sheep hear. So there are some shepherds that are authorized and some that are not authorized. And that is where heaven's theocratic order comes in because you can either have the authority or not have the authority. The Leviticus says that the only ministers that are true ministers are those who are called by God. And the call must come from God. And on earth, that ministerial right is validated by the functioning of the association, by the authorization of the porter or, or the one in charge. That is where the ministerial credential license comes from. This is, God has made it plain and, and showed in different angles using common sense, practical things so that we can see how we are to operate. There's no other way. The church cannot be some Babylonian confusion, free for all, wild, wild west, conf confusing disorderly mess. Now, as far as the teaching of the truth and the building of the temple and its spiritual um, significance, it also is um, built upon order. Zechariah 4 and verse 10, for who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven they are the eyes of the Lord, which run to and fro through the whole earth. The day this scripture is fulfilled is the day in which the Lord of hosts starts a reformatory work in an apparently small, in an apparently very small and insignificant way. And those who despise small and insignificant beginnings will at last rejoice and shall see that antitypical Zerubbabel is the one to direct the work along with all seven his helpers. So if the president is the chief administrator of the affairs of the association, 
and the porter is the one in charge, then they all they will also must be the antitypical Zerubbabel, directing the work with all of the helpers. This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel. This method, which God is to use now in the communicate in the time of the end in communicating with Zerubbabel, who is interpreted to be the governors or ministers of his people. So Zerubbabel is a type that applies plurally to the governors or ministers of his people. So God is gonna have a people, members of his association, and he's gonna have ministers to govern it. And that, and the way that God communicates to those ministers is in Zechariah 4, is laid down in the symbolism. So let us carefully decipher it symbol by symbol. So Zerubbabel is a type or representative of the ministers of the work of the shepherd's rod message in the last days. And these seven tubes reflect the ministry. So as the oil is poured into the bowl by the golden pipes, the truth is established in the books of the spirit of prophecy. And these ministers take the truth out of the bowl and deliver it to the candlestick, meaning they teach the truth to the church members. This is the method, method in which God is communicating to antitypical Zerubbabel or the Zerubbabels. They are inspired to teach this message to the church. Now, what if you want to contradict the ministry? You're going outside of heaven's law and order. The symbolic unit having demonstrated that the Bible can be rightly interpreted only by the spirit that dictated it shows that the church can be led into all truth only by the spirit controlled method. The spirit is in control through inspiration. Without inspiration, man has no hope because by searching, he can't, he can't find out God. So this whole independence thing is foolishness because what you're really saying is that you're independent of God and you cannot do God's work being independent of him. Continuing through the interpreters, the two golden pipes who alone are qualified and enabled to bring forth meat in due season, golden oil from the scriptures, olive trees into the storehouse, golden bowl of present truth. And in turn, through the minister, seven tubes who alone are to pass on from the bowl the oil to the church candlestick that it might illumine with light, the, the light of life, this dark and dying world of ours. That's it. The ministers are to pass the oil from the, from the bowl to the church. And that is how the church will be able to illuminate the world. Let's take a look at this quote from Patriarchs and Prophets. The fifth commandment requires children not only to yield respect, submission, and obedience to their parents, but also to give them love and tenderness, to lighten their cares, to guard their reputation, and to succor and comfort them in, the, in old age. It also enjoins respect for ministers and rulers and for all others to whom God has delegated authority. Wow, that's a part of the fifth commandment. When I read this this week, I kind of shuddered. I said, whoa. So the, the, the governor, the God's servant, respect, the fifth commandment commands us to have respect and God's ministers, God's ministry, the seven tubes, the, the, 
God commands us to have respect for them. There is a brother who has a different um, anti-vax theories, conspiracy theory, foolishness. That's what it is. Fake, fake news, fake videos, and the person is sharing it thinking that they're wise and they're so smart and the stuff is fake. The, the people, they make a video, they take a video clip of something else happening they put themselves on video or they do a voiceover and say that this is um, a scene of, um, this is a scene of uh, a certain incident happening in this country or that country. And it looks like it could be that, but that's not what it is. It was something else um, that, that kind of looks like it could be that. This is the devil. And um, they say, look at what's happening in Australia. They're, they're forcing the kids to take a vaccine. And Davidians, who are supposed to be close reasoners and logical thinkers, are sharing these videos and um, undermining the teachings of the association and thinking that they're wise while they're being fooled by the video in the first place. And then, like, just making insinuations like, you know, God's association is not faithful or not knowledgeable or whatever. And and then pushing the ideas. And then when you're trying to, I was trying to talk to this brother and then he's being rude. And I'm just thinking, wow, look at the disrespect. The person is fooled and they have the wrong idea and their doctrines are built on, on, on weak principles and false ideas, and you're trying to bring them to an understanding, but they're think that they think that they're teaching you and they're being disrespectful. So I told the person, when you can have some respect, then we can talk, but we can't talk while, while, while you're being rude and disrespectful. And then if they, don't, they can't see that, then they need to spend time with God so that they can see it. But th there's a fifth commandment. It, it also enjoins respect for ministers and rulers and for all others to whom God has delegated authority. And especially if somebody is, is, is set there by God to help you, even the earthly governments, Romans, Romans um, 13 said that he's a minister of good in the general sense, not in wicked acts that's clearly against what's written and trying to control the speed of traffic and, and uh, uh, enforce laws that protect the, the rights of life and everything like that, this is good. So your parents' will for you is good. The, the seven tubes, the ministry's will for your life is good. So that's another reason why we should have respect. Okay, but even those 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 who teach the message of seven twos are under the authority of the rod, since none but the spirit of truth who transmitted the mysteries of inspiration can interpret them, then those who attempt to teach them without this inspired interpretational authority inevitably fall into the forbidden practice of private interpretation, the great evil which has brought Christendom into its present almost boundless state of schism and consequent confusion, strife, and impotency. And as, as we dare not follow in such a path, we must therefore, as teachers of the shepherd's rod, teach only in the light of the rod those passages which in one way or another need to be interpreted. So we teach in the light of the rod, we are bound to do that. Teach the message as it is, add nothing to it, neither take anything from it. Do not feel that it is your duty to answer everybody's questions or to explain the whole Bible and the spirit of prophecy. Only a silly person attempts such a thing. The scroll is not yet unrolled that far. Do not go beyond what the shepherd's rod has explained. 
And this is a great temptation for many teachers. So we see that the shepherd's rod message establishes that there must be a porter at the door until Ezekiel 9. He is the one in charge, he or she, and he is given authority to authorize shepherds, ministers, and the ministers who attempt to get into the sheepfold without going through the door are unauthorized imposters. The authorized ministers through Zerubbabel are given authority to teach the message and they thereby are his helpers in governing the people and they themselves are under the authority of the rod. We see the system in authority, right? System in order. This very truth to which we are listening this afternoon will therefore, on the one hand, slay those who reject it together with those who are disobedient to it. But on the other hand, save those who give heed to it and who comply with its requirements. Now it is up to all of us individually to decide whether we should hear the voice of man or the voice of God's rod. God's rod is what establishes this theocratic order and the system of authority. That's God's rod. So what are we going to listen to man who tells us that, that we are all priests of the Lord, like Korah, Dathan, and Abiram were saying? That's the voice of man. Satan telling those angels that they didn't need the law of God and it was restricting them and they could do their own thing. That's the voice of man. The rod says that Lucifer... Uh, that, that the angels were listening to Lucifer, who was a man in heaven. So man's plans are contrary to God's plans always. But we have a choice. We can submit to the rod or we can choose to be goats and sheep. But those who go into the promised land are going to go into the promised land under the rod. The same way it was in the type. This is now everyone's test, and it must be everyone's concern. For one of these two voices, the voice of men or the voice of God's rod, will determine everyone's, de everyone's destiny, either for eternal death or for eternal life. Amen. So I'm going to have a prayer to close this. Um, we're on some missionary work right now. So um we're just going to have a short question and answer session. Um, and if it's a pressing question, and then we will close out. Um, we thank you for joining. This recording will eventually be available on YouTube for those to review. And we pray that it will be a blessing. All right, I'm going to kneel. <clears throat> Father in heaven, it is written that we um, will we have a choice. We either hear the voice of man or the voice of God's rod. And it's everyone's test. Help us to eradicate self, selfish ambition, pride, office-seeking, vainglory, and self-will from our hearts so that we can be faithful members of your true church and those uh, beings who reflect angels. Help us to see that everything in the universe has law and order and system and order, and it must be so. So help us to see the need for this in your church and to cooperate with it. We pray that you would bless your workers near and far and that we would Help us, you would help us to be wise and come under the authority of your rod. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.